Hello everyone, Hyper here and welcome to the Big Dumb Strats video for Queen Ashara. Now, this video will be pretty long, so I suggest watching this video in sections, otherwise you will just be overloaded with information. Typically this fight will take you a few weeks to progress, so just watch the section that you're currently working on and maybe look at the information for the next phase, but I don't recommend watching the entire video in one sitting because that's just going to be way too much and you'll miss important points that we make during the phase that's actually relevant to you. I'm once again joined by Lozi and Shampi to help me out with tanking and healing, but let's just jump straight into the strategy because this video will probably take a while. First of all, let's talk raid comp. You should have two tanks, three healers, favoring holy paladins and this priest, more on this in the healer section, and an assortment of DPS on this fight, both single target and cleave damage is very important. So basically any DPS works here. So on the mythic version of this fight, the main mythic mechanics are the divide and conquer, which is a laser that will split the room in half that instant kills any players that walk into it. It can only be crossed with teleport abilities or immunities, uh, for example, blink or paladin bubble. The beam will rotate 360 degrees in phase four, but it remains stationary in every other phase. The other mythic mechanic is Arcane Vulnerability. This becomes active after Phase 1, when Ajara herself becomes attackable. Whenever you're in line of sight of Ajara, you'll gain one stack of Arcane Vulnerability every 3 seconds from her Arcane Missiles. This causes you to take more damage from all Arcane damage in the fight. And since a lot of the relevant raid damage on this fight is rather bursty, for example Spears or Bursts, and you have less max HP, this can cause deaths if it's left unmanaged and you don't reset your stacks. While not being as big of an issue as it was pre-nerf, there still needs to be some order to soaking wards. Aside from phase one, you will soak once in phase two, twice in phase three, except for five or six people near the end of the order, and once in phase four. In phase one, Zara should only get one drain ward cast off, so you need to assign five range DPS to soak no more than four stacks each after the ward gets drained. Starting in Phase 2, all players should soak to 5 stacks when it is their turn. Use a weak order to set up the order before the pull. There's a few publicly available ones that are pretty good. The first 8 people soaking in this phase will soak the center ward. You should start with melee and then fill in the rest, ending with a ranged that can blink across the beam after soaking. The rest of the players should be assigned to soak the console ward. In Phase 3 and Phase 4, players should simply follow the natural cadence of their debuff and soak whenever it is faded on the current rune that the boss is nearest. The only exception to this is the beginning of Phase 4, where you can hold off on one person soaking the third pillar and tell them to soak the middle rune of power while you pull the boss across the room. This will allow you to fully drain the rune of power if there are any remaining stacks in it. As you progress through the fight, you may have to change the soak order of certain people based on mechanics or cooldowns. Make sure you swap all of their soaks, not just the ones that are causing the issue. The phase one strategy is pretty straightforward. Your ranged DPS should be spread throughout the room to cover all the possible arcane orb soak locations, regardless of the divide and conquer beam. Beckon, which can target ranged DPS and healers, will always pull you to the same location in this phase, which is right next to the left pillar if you're facing the back of the room. This means that you need to keep the location of the divide and conquer beam in mind, otherwise you might get dragged through it if you get targeted by the charm. If targeted by charged spear, simply avoid throwing it into any structures, so this is the console or the two pillars because on Mythic, this will most likely cause a wipe during early progress. Your target push time for this phase is about 2 minutes and 15 seconds. This happens right after the second set of arcane orbs are done being soaked. Overall, your damage needs to stop at around 10% on each add, and then it can be resumed once the orbs are cast. This is just to make sure that you're pushing at the appropriate time, not too early and not too late. To kill Hawks, since you only get 1 CC, the longest duration CC you can get is Binding Shot from a Hunter. If your raid does not have that available, assign a single target long duration stun such as Kidney Shot or Hand of Justice to stun the Hulk after it starts moving towards a ward. And it's important to let it run a few yards then stun it and always keep the location of the stun consistent 
for any classes that need to drop AoE effects on the Hulk. For DPS, the only important thing in this phase are the overzealous Hulks. All DPS who are able should swap to him and Hulks should die before reaching the ward that they are headed to. Now you'll probably have to experiment with this a little bit. Typically at this point in progress or at this point in the patch, you won't need to assign damage cooldowns to it. But if you do, you can assign one or two two minute cooldowns to the first Hulk and then just have every single DPS swap to the second one, because at that point you should be stopping damage on the mini bosses anyway, so you just need the target to hit. At least one melee DPS should be hitting Athenel to cover all interrupts with the tank, and here you just alternate kicks to make sure people don't get hit by chain lightning. All cooldowns should be used on pull, so two minute cooldowns, three minute cooldowns, because based on our kill timing, of this first phase, everything will be back up in the second phase. The two bosses should be DPS down equally just to prevent them from enraging if Pawn is killed too soon. Um, so just have your raid either be split, um, DPSing one or the other, or just have people swap based on how the percentage is looking. That's completely up to you. So we'll talk about healing, but first I just want to make a quick mention of healer comp for this fight. Because the main mechanic of this fight revolves around having reduced max health, HPS is reduced in its effectiveness, and instead what becomes most valuable is shields and damage reduction to gain extra effective health and then prevent one-shots. Additionally, because there are relevant DPS checks on the fight, the dominant strategy is to 3 heal, and in terms of which healers are best, for those reasons, the best healers for this fight are of course Monk and Druid. On a serious note, Disc and Holy Pally are obviously the meta healers for damage, damage reduction, and frequent cooldowns. One additional major reason to bring these two healers is that they make dealing with beckons a lot easier. Paladins can bop dangerous beckons, as well as immune them with bubble. And priests can grip beckon targets for when you don't have bops to spare. Uh, you can make any healer comp work this late into the tier, but you want as many paladins and priests as you can get your hands on. If you have, say, two discs and two Holy Pallies to pick from, I would personally recommend two Holy Pallies and one disc, unless you have a red or a prop paladin whose bop you can rely on, in which case go for two discs, one Holy Pally. Of course, that's just the most optimal comp. You can make other comps work, like uh, one Pally, one disc, one Shaman, or even something less meta than that could work. Phase 1 doesn't have that much of a healing check. The main thing to pay attention to is tank damage. If you have two Holy Pallies, you can assign one Paladin to each tank. But if you have one, I would suggest putting that Paladin on the Aethanel tank because that tank is going to suffer spikier damage and your other healers can prioritize the Serenus tank. Beyond tank healing, Serenus will periodically throw spears that will do raid-wide damage. This is only fatal if it hits the spears or a console or if it overlaps with the Arcane Orbs. On topic of Arcane Orbs, the first set will spawn at 1 minute and 8 seconds, and the second set will spawn a minute later at 2 minutes and 8 seconds. If you have short healing cooldowns, you should use them on the first set of Arcane Orbs, and it'll be back up for when you need it in Phase 2. And then for the second set of Arcane Orbs, you can use a single raid-wide cooldown like Devo or Shout, and it will be back up in time for Phase 3 when you need it. Because the raid is only in danger during the orbs, you should allow one healer to do the majority of the spear healing, and the other healers just focus on damage and spot healing the tanks and using their cooldowns during orbs, then swapping back to DPSing outside of those windows. If you're already having issues killing the overzealous hulks, I would recommend healers using punch cards and DPS trinkets, as well as maybe even Crucible of Flame as a major to burst them down so that they don't get any slams off. It's also beneficial to have as much damage as possible for later on in the fight. Since each tank is going to solo tank their mini boss in this phase, you should decide who is tanking what before the fact. Aethanel does more magic damage, while Serranus is going to do more physical damage. For example, just don't put a warrior on Aethanel unless you have to. As the Aethanel tank, you do need to worry about her ice shard shatter and use a heavy personal or external each time. While this damage isn't always fatal, there's nothing else to cool down in this fight for a while. You also occasionally get unlucky with Lightning Orb bounces once you are stunned, so having a CD rolling can help there. You should plan for three of these in this phase, but just know that cast timings are consistent, so stun timings will vary pull to pull. 
You should also grab every other kick as the eighth and L tank. Just try to kick every cast and you should be able to get every other one. The Serenus tank doesn't need to worry about his debuff. It should naturally drop while he does his abilities or from any dodge or parry. The only mechanic you need to worry about controlling as a tank is Cursed Heart. At 100 energy, either boss will drop a permanent puddle underneath your position. If they are casting at 100 energy, they will drop it under themselves instead. You can stack this, and you want to try to stack this as much as possible, but also realize that the pools on the ground also stack. If you drop four of them on top of each other, when you walk into that puddle again, you will have four debuffs and take four times the amount of damage. This doesn't need to be perfectly clean, but all of them shouldn't be spread out either. Do not drop any of these puddles next to pillars, as that space will be needed later on by the raid. The Serranus tank will also not want to drop along the wall, as that real estate may be needed for beckons later on. In terms of overall boss movement, start by pulling them together and allow DPS to cleave for a short duration at the beginning of the fight. After about 5 or 7 seconds, move the bosses apart to the positions marked on the screen using a pillar as a line of sight breaker. Keep the bosses in this orientation until their first painful memories buff has faded. It's okay to move forwards and backwards to deal with puddles. Just make sure to keep the bosses always out of line of sight of each other. Once painful memories has dropped, only the eighth and L tank should move her to this new position shown. Since you will likely have to stop DPS in this phase, you don't need to stack the bosses up here, as this only risks Serranus dropping a random puddle somewhere in the middle of the room. Pulling her out early ascertains that she is in position for when both of them cast Longing, and it's important to note that Longing is significantly shorter than Painful Memories. Once the Longing buff fades, she can be moved back into the original position, and you will remain in this orientation until the end of the phase. The intermission in this fight is very straightforward once you understand it, and we found that the easiest way of dealing with it is to just import a weak aura and put up the markers that I have shown on the screen. There's a few great weak auras that will simply assign every single person to a job to do based on the debuffs they get. If you use the weak aura that I have in the link below, then going to orange will mean that you will be stacking with a few other people. Staying on blue and going left means that you're soaking by yourself. Staying on blue and going right means that you're soaking by yourself. Staying on blue and going slightly forward means that you're grouping with other people. Running to yellow and running around uh, the yellow marker means that you're running with other people. Running to yellow and standing still, you're just the person that the people are running around. And then all the other marks that are left, so there should be three other ones, are simple solo soaks. The only important thing that you pretty much need to do is that you need to stack up properly before the intermission starts because this will determine where your orbs will spawn. If you have a few people wandering off and doing other things, you might get orb spawns in random locations, so then your entire intermission strategy might just be thrown off. Phase 2 is a simple DPS burn. You simply need to push the boss to 68% before you get the big spider ad that if you do get, it's pretty much a wipe. So in phase 2, you do need to assign a few CCs for the devoted ads that happen about 25 seconds after the phase starts. Ideally, you will want to have a monk leg sweep with the improved leg sweep talent so it has bigger range. Um, then for the, your second stun, it can be pretty much any AoE stun, anything from Warlocks um, or Warrior, Shockwave, anything works, you just need to make sure you hit all of them. After that times out, you can have a Mage stay behind and Dragon Breath the adds, and if they're still alive, then just have a Priest use their knockback ability to knock all the adds away from the ward, ideally towards the console, just to make it easier for your DPS to finish them off. The cast time of these ads is pretty fast, so you need to make sure that you properly change these CCs or they will get their sacrifice off and you will get more energy on the ward. Second big mechanic that gets introduced in this phase is obviously the Arcane Burst. And dealing with the Arcane Burst dispel in this phase and the next phase is a huge part of the difficulty of this fight. Ideally, you will want to assign three Warlocks for the dispels, each dealing with one specific dispel. 
I know that most groups will probably not have three warlocks, so you can make do with either shadow priests or your healers actually running in line of sight and dispelling as needed. However, if you do have a warlock, then you will simply need to make sure that they position their pet in the appropriate spot as shown on the screen here. And you can use this with a macro that will move your pet. And you need to make sure that your pet is on assist Otherwise, it might try to move away from the spot to do other stuff. Now, if your pet is in the specific spot shown on the screen, it will be able to attack the boss and be in line of sight of the dispels. And doing dispels with the pet is obviously great because no player actually takes damage from this. And you can use a simple dispel macro that I will have linked in the description box. Um, and I will also put it in the comment section just to make sure you guys get it. Now, as far as how to assign the order, there's a few ways of doing this. You can either have your boss timer add-on, either DBM or bigwigs, mark the three players that get the arcane burst, and always follow a specific mark rotation. For example, you can just go like star, circle, diamond, or whatever the marks are, and those players will always get dispelled in that rotation, and each player who is dispelling will know which mark to dispel when it's time. Another alternative is using a weak aura. There's a few great ones. I will link the one that I like using uh, in the description box that will simply put up a priority and then your dispellers will simply know if they're dispelling first, second, or third. The second set of arcane bursts in this phase might be a little bit tight based on your boss DPS. If the boss is at about 70.5% when the second arcane bursts go out, then you need to be fairly quick. If you're anything higher than that on the boss's HP, you can go at a normal pace. But just make sure you try to do these bursts as fast as possible on both sets, just to kind of practice that urgency. For DPS in this phase is super straightforward. It's a single target damage burn. You need to push the boss before an important mechanic happens. The only caveat being that you need one or two people who are kind of specced for large AoE damage bursts to deal with the devoted ads. But that being said, you need to pop two and three minute cooldowns as they come up. Two minute cooldowns should be up right at the beginning. Three minute cooldowns should be up probably about 15 seconds into this phase. The players who are spec for burst AoE should be either your Frost DK, Red Paladin, or, or any classes that don't lose much single target damage by taking Focusing Iris Major. As far as I know, Hunters are pretty good for this. Experiment until you find the right balance because you don't want to overkill these adds and then have too many people go AoE, but you also don't want to run into a situation where you have too few people going AoE and your adds are ending up getting cast off and charging the ward needlessly. One tip I can give to DPS players here that have short duration magic mitigation, uh, like DKs and rogues mostly, I think those are actually the only two classes, you can pre-cast your AMS or your Cloak of Shadows before the Arcane Burst debuff goes out. Um, and if it does target you, you will simply immune it and your raid will only have to deal with two debuffs instead of three. And you get to stay and hit the boss more without having to go and deal with the spells. So for healing phase two, there's not much to do, but this phase does introduce the two main mechanics that you as a healer will be interacting with, which is reduced max health and arcane missiles. Once a Jara becomes active, she'll hit anybody in line of sight with arcane missiles, turning the damage pattern of this fight into consistent ticking damage. This phase has the first real DPS check, so healers should coordinate to maximize DPS as much as possible. Holy Pallies want to be using their wings essentially on cooldown for the entire fight, so that means that it lines up allowing them to carry the beginning of this phase. Other healers should be focusing on DPSing as much as possible, and you want to get Ajara to phase three before you get the second set of beckons, ideally. In terms of beckons, assuming you have two bops available, you want to use your first bop on the DPS, who gets the first beckon in phase two. You want to save your second bop for phase three, but you want to throw your first bop in phase two so that it'll be back up in phase four for when you really need it. For boss positioning in phase two, start by moving the boss across the center ward closer to the console. This will allow the melees to do their soaks at the center rune of power while hitting the boss and to cleave the devoted adds when they spawn. 
After the divide and conquer beam appears, the ads should be dying. Move the boss to the edge of the console to make dropping vulnerability stacks very simple on the outer edge of the console. Tank swaps in this phase can be done kind of whenever. Generally, it's after two or three jolts whenever your debuff has dropped and you feel it is safe to do a swap. Unlike Heroic, you need to fully line of sight the boss until your debuff is dropped due to the boss shooting out missiles every three seconds. This will take 15 seconds, and unfortunately, there is not much you can do other than heal yourself if you are a class that can even do that. You shouldn't need to use any defensive cooldowns in this phase. Just let them recharge from phase one and hold them until phase three. The second intermission is exactly like the first one, except that the boss is still up. So the only thing that you want to change is that if you can, you want to hit the boss. This is especially people that are stacked on blue marker um, or any people that are kind of solo soaking on orange and are in range of the boss to actually cast a few abilities because the phase three damage check is actually quite important. But then moving into the phase three, this is what makes or breaks your progress. This is where you will spend most of your pulls uh, because it is by far the most difficult phase of this fight. In this phase, you will want to assign at least four melee to interrupt the tide mistresses uh, with a few ranged DPS as backups because at some points you will need to line of sight and specifically after shield breaks, you will probably need a ranged DPS or a death knight or a DH to grab that kick. Start this phase by positioning on the outside edge of the console to prevent taking damage from the boss. This also means that you will start by killing Lady Venom Tongue. When the ad is at around 10% HP, most of your raid can start moving toward the second ad, with ranged DPS being able to move a little bit sooner. The first Tide Mistress, Lady Venom Tongue, should die before she gets to shield. Which Tide Mistress you choose to kill second will depend on the laser beam that you get in this phase. Always go to the side that is not blocked by the laser, it's fairly straightforward. Once you get to the second Tide Mistress, your raid should position on the outside edge of the pillar, right where the pillar meets the ward the ad is standing on as shown in this graphic. The second cast of charged spear should be used to break the shield of the second Tide Mistress. Whenever a spear is used to break the ad's shield, the raid should line of sight because it will cause an explosion shortly after the break happens that can be prevented by staying behind the pillar. Please note that the explosion is delayed by almost half a second, so even though the shield is broken, the damage has not gone out yet. Just make sure you wait a second and then go out into line of sight to actually DPS the ad. Players who are soaking the ward at the time or are targeted by the spear should use a small personal cooldown to ensure they survive because they will be taking many instances of damage over a very short period of time. The second Tide Mistress needs to die before recasting its shield. During this time, the Myrmidon should die to passive cleave as long as it's tanked near this ad. The second Myrmidon will spawn as the raid moves to the third ward. Simply mirror the positioning of the previous ward. The first spear from this Myrmidon should be used to break the Tide Mistress's shield, but it will only be broken for a few seconds, so your DPS should still be killing the Myrmidon, not the third Tide Mistress. The second spear should again be used to break her shield, after which the Myrmidon should be killed because you will have a third one spawning pretty soon, and ideally you want to kill it before you get another cast of charged spear. Until the third Myrmidon spawns and is actually moved into the position so your raid can hit it, your DPS should be simply hitting the third Tide Mistress, after which they should swap to the Myrmidon as soon as it's in line of sight. The third Myrmidon only needs to be alive for one shield break, and after you get that one break with it, it should be your highest DPS priority to actually finish it off. At this point, your Tide Mistress should be below 50% health, and looking at having some time to actually move the boss onto the ward so you can cleave both of them down together and try to get both the boss to 50% and kill the Tide Mistress before she either reshields or the boss is pushed. Just make sure to keep an eye on the energy of the Tide Mistress because if it reaches full, she will shield. And at this point, you're not getting any more Myrmidons, so if that happens, it means a wipe. Now specifically for DPS, this phase is composed of multiple damage checks. The first two adds are huge damage checks, so cooldowns should be assigned to each one. 
Typically, the majority of 2 minute cooldowns will be assigned to the first Tide Mistress. And here, mages and rogues are great. Then 3 minute cooldowns or any 2 minute cooldowns that are slightly delayed, um, like Death Knight Birth of Sindragosa, for example, can be assigned to the second Tide Mistress. The first Myrmidon should simply die to cleave if it's tanked correctly and your rate has decent cleave damage. However, after killing the second Tide Mistress, if the Myrmidon is still alive, just make sure to single target it down because you never want to deal with having two Myrmidons up at the same time. Now the third add is a slow burn. You can take your sweet time here. All your damage cooldowns should be held from this point on for Bloodlust at the start of Phase 4. Small cooldowns like Meteor or Pillar of Frost can still be used just to kill off the new Myrmidons that spawn, but anything that's 2 minutes or longer should be held onto. So Phase 3 and to a lesser extent Phase 4 are when your healers are really going to pull their weight on this fight. And the main thing to note about phase three is that you're going to constantly have Myrmidons up who are going to throw spears about every 16 seconds or so. A spear is going to deal damage to whoever it passes through, as well as an AoE damage once it times out. And if it hits a pillar, it's going to do a massive AoE and probably wipe your raid. What that means for healers is that anybody targeted by the spear is going to take the spear projectile, the shield shatter from the siren, as well as the spear explosion whilst having max reduced health. So your goal as a healer during all of this is to prevent one-shots that involve the spear explosions. For the spears that pop shields, there's going to be a brief window between when the shield shatter happens and the spear explosion happens, allowing you about a second or less to quickly top up the target of that projectile. This is where pre-shields become extremely valuable because it allows people to have more effective health and reliably survive these one-shot combos. Another option for healers, if you're light on DR, spot healing, or shields, is to have one of your healers take Well of Existence as their major and use it after the spear target gets hit with the spear, but before it explodes so that they're topped up for the explosion. So the second consideration for healers in this phase is that you still have Arcane Bursts from Phase 2 happening periodically. For the first set of Bursts, you can and should have a cooldown like Devo or Shout to prevent those players from being one-shot because it overlaps with a spear. We found it best to rush the first two dispels in this dispel set and then let the spear explode and then let the third get dispelled or time out. For the second set of dispels, we found it best to just rush all three before the charged spear goes out, but your mileage may vary. One tricky thing to note about this phase is that the boss and subsequently the tanks will frequently be LOSing the raid which means that you have to position yourself carefully so that you can be an LOS of the tank, but not be an LOS of Ajara, and then just constantly be an LOS of the tank as much as possible and throw your hots and buffs on them, and then drop LOS when you need to for shields, shatters, and, and things like that. Once you get into the rhythm of shielding, buffing, and hotting anybody who gets a debuff in this phase, the main concern is probably going to be tank damage, especially during movement. When you go from Siren 2 to Siren 3, just be wary of tank damage and throw an external if you need to. So another thing to note for this phase, for healers specifically, is beckons. Uh, healers always are one of the targets for beckons, and this is extremely painful in this phase specifically. So there's not much to say other than always plan to get every single beckon back to back. The main piece of advice that I have is just be prepared to waddle to the edge of the room. Utilize gateways if you need to, utilize any movement that you have, and call for grips if you have to as well. If you do have two bops available for this fight, and assuming that you used your first one in phase two, which is highly recommended, you can use your second bop on the first beckon set in phase three. Not on a healer, you should probably use it on the DPS, but it does make that beckon set a little easier, especially because the first beckon set in phase three can be a little tricky if you get a poor cut or beam spawn. And lastly, one note about healer cooldowns for this phase. So how we choose to assign cooldowns is to use big three-minute cooldowns on Myrmidon spear throws. We typically use one cooldown on the first spear throw at Siren 2, which overlaps with bursts, one cooldown on the second spear throw at Siren 2, and then one on the first spear throw at Siren 3. If you use any cooldowns later than this in the fight, then they're not going to be back up for when you need them in phase four. To start this phase, Ajara should remain where she is, which is in her phase 2 position. The other tank should pick up the Myrmidon in the middle of the room. 
This spawns randomly around the ring, so you just kind of have to look for it. Pull the Myrmidon around the console, basically in line with Venom Tongue. After three jolts, you'll do your first swap, and depending on which side you get will determine your next actions. If you get a beam that forces you to the far side of the console, Jara should mostly remain where she is. Pull her a few steps back so that your other tank can remain LOS of her the whole time, as they do not want to tank a random missile and roll their stacks. That tank should be moving the Myrmidon in position so that his spear can break the second Tide Mistress's shield and should move as soon as possible. This will be well before Venom Tongue dies. The Azara tank, however, does not leave the console until the Arcane Detonation goes off and will probably need at least one movement to be an increasing effect to get her in position for the second pillar, which is on the far side of the room. If you get the close side available to you, there are two options here. Zara positioning can be mirrored on the opposite side of the console. Since this will involve moving her across the console, try to keep which side you pull her on consistent so your other tank knows where to hide and won't roll stacks. The second option is for the Azara tank to leave as soon as possible and get her into the standard Pillar 2, Pillar 3 position. This also will require some sort of movement speed ability and will require you to hug the pillar in order to not get cut by the laser. There's not a ton of room for error with this, but we found it slightly easier in the long run than just flipping the boss's positioning. If you do opt to use this strategy, just know that you will not receive healing for about 10 seconds. On pillars 2 and 3, the boss should be positioned on the far side of the pillar from the console such that the boss is out of LOS of the raid, but that you are not. Swap should be done every three jolts. This roughly lines up with a Myrmidon spear and with every arcane detonation. Have the Myrmidon tank taunt Azara first so that she doesn't move. While not tanking Azara and tanking Myrmidons, you should hug the pillar such that you are out of line of sight of both arcane burst dispels and shield breaks, but that the Myrmidon spear can still hit the tide mistress. After your second swap on the second pillar, the second Tide Mistress should be almost dead. Whoever isn't taking Ajara should be free at this point and pick up the new Myrmidon. It basically spawns at the same time when you have to do that swap. Since you're moving across the room, the Ajara tank might need to use a cooldown here as well. The combination of healers moving, the raid taking extra missile damage, and you being line of sight can result in lower than expected incoming healing until everybody gets fully set up on that third pillar. The first part of this pillar operates exactly like the second pillar. Right before the second swap, she will cast Arcane Detonation again. Don't worry about Ajara moving here, as she will probably come into the raid, but after the swap, get her back into position as soon as possible. The third Myrmidon will spawn shortly after this tank swap and should be picked up by the free tank. Continue doing tank swaps on this pillar until after the second Arcane Detonation. Since you are coming up on the end of this phase, your raid may want you to tank Ajara near the third Tide Mistress for Cleave. During this time, Ajara will be in line of sight of the whole raid. Your health may be a little lower here, but you shouldn't need to use any cooldowns. The tank trying to drop stacks will probably have to go as far as the dispel location in order to do so. Phase 4 can seem very difficult and very complex to people, but it's essentially just a choreographed raid movement and as long as you follow it uh, you shouldn't have too much issues in this phase. So basically you push into phase 4 right when the boss reaches 50% or all three tide mistresses are dead. Right after the boss is pushed into this phase everyone should use the pillar to reset their vulnerability stacks. This is because you will be bloodlusting and you want to be able to burn the boss without having to worry about having to line a sight. Before the first nether portal is cast, all your ranged DPS and healers should position into the shown location to bait the circles. Then as soon as the nether portal is cast, simply click the warlock gate and then head over to the console. Depending on your raised DPS, you will either need to deal with two or three sets of overloads. Assign one immunity class for each set and make sure you have at least one backup because stuff happens and people might need to use their immunities early. Paladins and mages are ideal, but other classes can be used as well. The first overload will require three console presses, second will have four, and the third will also have four. Whenever you're pressing the console, you want to be in your immunity, 
and you want to make sure that you space the clicks out enough that your healers have time to top your raid off between damage instances. And your raid should also be dropping stacks often here, if not completely line of sighting the boss to prevent damage. Ideally, your raid will have a few battle reses saved up, which will allow you to res the players who get the damage buff after it times out. Your raid should be resetting vulnerability stacks pretty frequently in this phase. Typically, I like to do it before reaching 5 stacks. Right after dealing with the first set of overloads, you will get a set of piercing gaze dodges. After this, your range should move into position to bait the second nether portal cast, while using the pillar to reset vulnerability stacks. The direction of the divide and conquer laser determines which pillar your raid will move towards. Always move in the direction that the laser is moving, so this means either chasing it or moving ahead of it. Right after baiting the second nether portal, you will get a set of beckons, and again, this is a great set to use your bops on if you can, or use life grips to save the players. This is because the laser beam will be rotating into the players, and the range will also have the nether portals on them, so making sure they're safe is a top priority here. After the laser disappears, simply collapse back to the console for the second overload. After the second overload, you will again get a set of piercing gazes. During the third gaze of this set, your ranged and healers need to move to the center of the room on either side of the ward to bait the third set of nether portals, after which you will collapse back to the console. This can be a tricky one to do because you need to be dodging the gazes from the boss while also moving into position to bait, so blinks and any movement speed abilities here are great to take advantage of. If the boss is around 10% health, you're probably on pace to kill her without having to deal with the third set of overloads. If the boss is over 10%, you will need to deal with the third set of console overloads. And 10% is a rough mark, just kind of experiment with this based on your raid's DPS, um, and obviously how many people are still alive. If you have a few people dead, even if you're under 10%, you might still need to deal with that console because you are losing a few DPS. After the console, you will again get piercing gazes, and then after the gazes, you will need to move to the third pillar that should be the last open area of the room to bait the last set of nether portals, after which the boss should be pretty much dying. For DPS, this phase is a single target burn where you need to kill the boss before you just lose too many players. It's essentially phase two on steroids. Right as this phase starts, you should reset vulnerability stacks so that you can DPS during the entire Bloodlust without having to line of sight. 3 minute classes will most likely only get one use in this phase, so it should be during Bloodlust. Depending on your kill time, 2 minute classes will most likely get 2 uses, with the second being during the last set of console clicks. Like I said, from a DPS perspective, this phase is super simple. You just need to make sure you're managing the abilities and the mechanics the boss throws at you, Ultimately, the most important thing in this phase is not dying to one-shot mechanics that are avoidable, while still dealing a reasonable amount of damage to the boss. You might also have quite a large damage swing in this last phase depending on who the damage buff from the console goes on to. If it goes on to a Fire Mage or a Destro Warlock, for example, your boss damage will be out of this world. If it goes on a class who doesn't benefit from it as much, your boss DPS might be a little bit lower. So that's something that you kind of need to take into consideration, especially when it comes to dealing with the last set of console, because if you got lucky with the damage buff, you might be able to skip a set of mechanics. The last tip I can give you in this phase is again pertaining to damage buff. If you do get it and your raid is out of battle reses, before you die you should soak to 10 stacks. Since you will be dying and you will be staying dead for the rest of the fight, you won't be able to help with soaks anymore. So just getting a few extra stacks to help your raid out when you know that you're going to die for sure can be very helpful and can make or break if you're going to be surging or not once you get towards the very end of the fight. So for healers, phase 4 is largely going to be a repeat of phase 2, but just tuned up to 11. Ajar is going to be doing way more damage because of reward energy, but the only damage your raid is going to be taking is from arcane missiles or console clicks. And assuming you've done the fight properly until now, the only thing left to do is rotate healing cooldowns and bait nether portals. The best way to rotate healing cooldowns for this phase is to use as much as possible during the console clicks just to keep your raid as healthy as they can be. 
But that said, your rage should constantly be re resetting anytime you're clicking the console. And it can even be necessary to have your rage fully LOS the boss while clicks are happening. It's not necessarily the increased arcane damage that's going to kill you, but taking a, a 60k arcane missile tick while doing clicks can and will be fatal. Another possible point of difficulty in this phase is that when you bait for the second time in the middle between console clicks two and three, you're going to be doing a lot of movement, and that's going to result in reduced healing and could kill people. So you should assign a strong healing cooldown if you have one to spare. If you have the DPS to skip a third console click, I would highly recommend using the cooldown that you would use on that console during this movement. So one thing to note for healers is that you should only have one set of beckons during this phase. You might have two if you have low DPS, but you should only have one. That beckon set should be between the first and second console when you run out to bait nether portals. And assuming that you have at least one bop and you use that bop in phase two, you will have that bop back up for this beckon set. I would highly recommend that you use this bop on a healer who gets your phase four beckon because it's way more important to have that extra healing going into the second console than the amount of damage that you would gain by bopping a DPS. Another thing to note about nether portals is that Mistweavers and Holy Pallies will have to run out to bait them as they aren't technically full melee. Because you can bring so many different healing comps to this fight and I can't tell you how to assign cooldowns for every healing comp, we're just going to include how I would assign healing cooldowns for a loosely meta comp and then you can plug and play based on which healers you have available to you. Phase 4 will start in the back of the room. Since Azara still gives stacks of missiles as the off tank, you will want to drop stacks as this phase goes on until your raid gets comfortable with the phase. Arcane Jolt is removed, however, it is replaced by a new mechanic called Void Touch. The upfront damage on this is low, but it will reduce your healing taken and stacks. Plan to take about 4 stacks each time you are tanking, but this isn't always the case. As her casts aren't exactly static, you should simply just swap whenever your co-tank drops, mechanics permitting. Defensive cooldowns in this phase should be held for after the first time you tank. The two scariest times tanking are during console clicks, except for the first one, and while the entire raid baits middle. This is around the third nether portals, and you'll generally be at around 3 plus stacks as well. Make sure you are also utilizing any raid CDs like Barrier if it's on the ground here. Lastly, you will probably have to move the boss near the end of the beam since it does a full 360. You don't want to drain any other ward other than the console longer than you have to. Always make sure to get her back to one side of the console so your entire raid can line aside easily to drop their stacks. Now the last phase, I wanted to just give you a few tips and tricks for this fight because there's a few gimmicky things. First of all, Bob can be used to break beckons. Most notably, at the beginning of phase 2, the first set of beckons can be broken by bobs just to allow your DPS to deal more damage without having to actually run away and deal with the beckon. In phase 3, the very first set of beckons can be kind of finicky because it's very close to the boss and you essentially might get dragged through the ward. So again, bobs are great during that. And then in phase 4, during your second nether portal bait, you should also bop your target if you have it back up because they will get the portal spawn on them, then get beckons, so they will be taking a lot of damage. The second tip is also relevant to beckons. Warlock gates can be taken while you're being charmed by beckon, or you can also just click a max range warlock gate, and that will be about the perfect distance to not get charmed. Ideally, you want to have the following warlock gates set up. In phase one, you want to have a Warlock portal that's set up right next to the beckon spot that goes just away towards the wall. In phase 3, you will want a Warlock portal on each of the pillars, or if you only have a Warlock, they need to make sure they reposition it. But you essentially want a gate that goes from near the pillar away from the boss. And again, this is to deal with those beckons. Thank you so much for watching this video, and thanks to Lozi and Champion for helping me out. Make sure to check out their Twitch and Twitter, which is linked in the description box. For next year, we're looking at coming out with these guides a lot, lot sooner, uh, so it should help a lot more people. But if you are trying to secure a last minute Queen Ashara kill, then hopefully this helps you out. Also, if you want a full walkthrough of the fight from a DPS perspective, uh, where I also mentioned some overall mechanics and strategy, 
you can check out my other Queen Ashara guide that I made while I was back in vodka. Again, thank you so much for watching and if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section or join my Discord. I'll see you guys on the next one.